Amen? Amen. All right, let's get our words out. Let's get the Bibles out. Right. And we're going to go ahead and sit down and we're going to get into the word about heaven. Oh, yay. <laughs> I like that picture right there. I think it goes well. A lot of these old comic books go really well with a very no-nonsense perspective on... Uh, on heaven. And you can see it's the heavenly here over here. And this guy has been taught that he can go to heaven while he's still his, he's still grounded himself. He's not really grounded in the Lord. You know, down the line you're going to find out different challenges are going to pop up and you're going to find out is your devotion to God forever or is it just a temporary thing? Is one step good enough for you or are you going to go all the way? Devotion to Jesus is all the way. And you'll find that we're going to get there. And this is an awesome picture. These guys in the old days, they did really good. Uh, really wake, waking us up and keeping us sober. Amen? Until we cross that last day, I don't, I don't intend to give anybody any, any room for, for casualness at all because it's of the devil. Because the Bible says to be sober because the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So we're going to be talking about heaven. And I called the message um, called The Standard. Okay? I'm going to turn this on right. real quick. And that's going to be Psalms 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. <coughs> it's entitled Heaven. It's called The Standard. This is Heaven's Standard, okay? Anybody remember that, sh that song called I Got Shoes? Um, a lot of old people, a lot of old songs, it's an old song, I'm not sure if it's a hymn or not, but it sings like, I got shoes, you got shoes, everybody, all of God's children got shoes, when I get to heaven, gonna put on my shoes, I'm gonna walk all over God's heaven, heaven, it's thinking about heaven, and it says, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there, that's what it said, everybody's talking about heaven ain't going there, okay, so I, well, my point is, is like, well, why is that true? If everybody's talking about heaven and they're not all going there, then what's, then what's the difference? I said, because they want to do right. Uh, the ones who really want to do right, they really want to break free, they're going to go full rogue. They're, going to, they're, they're actually going to, they're going to carry through for what it really costs. But Jesus said to count the cost. Heaven standard, we're going to get into that. I'm going to, I'm going to sum it up in about three different H's. And the three H's I'm going to get into in just a second. Three of them are like this. <coughs> Holiness. Humility and honesty. Holiness, humility, and honesty are the three H's, I believe, is the standard. I know that you can lay this thing out in many different ways. There's different ways of describing the actual standard. Jesus Christ himself is the only way. His blood, what he did at the cross when he said it is finished, that just so happens to be the only way. He is the only way. Belief in him, like Paris Reedhead says, it's not enough. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But that doesn't mean that acknowledging facts is going to save your soul. The Bible says that the devil believes in that kind of a way. Acknowledging truth. The devil knows that. In fact, he trembles at the powerful name of Jesus. So if, if believing in Jesus was enough to get you into heaven, then the devil would be going, and he most certainly is not. Okay, um, It's going to be a very big difference between someone who has truly committed themselves to Christ and one who is, is, is trying to play a game, okay? Why would somebody play a game? I'll tell you why. People who seem like they're pretty serious about their faith and they still are actually playing games with God, you know how they would ever do that? Because of false teachers. And here's a really good portrait, another one of those things, in one of those old comic books. Here's a portrait of the Broadway. It says this leads to destruction, okay? But then you got a bunch of idiots out there putting signs going right into the ground saying, Heaven! Another version, another way to go to heaven, even though it's on the path to destruction. This is what God's word says. Then a little, then a little half-blind idiot, false prophet comes there and nails a little thing and says, here's heaven, here's heaven. Another one, a bunch of different heaven signs on the path to destruction. I was like, wow, talk about a great picture. I had some idea, like last week I told you about the picture I wanted. A bunch of people pointing at each other, telling how they're not doing right when they themselves are not going through the straight gate. Okay, this is a picture I was just like, man. So eventually we're going to have to bring that one in here. That book is going to come in here. It's got some extremely good pictures in there, that, like, like that one we just saw. 
that really put stuff into perspective to help us stay sober and help us keep us to the standard. What is the standard? God's standard. Nothing else can budge. Nothing else will ever do. And if a false prophet comes in here and seduces you, it's no different than the devil seducing you. You know what happens? He only tempts you with your own lust. And you can either come when it comes up and you get the chance to face it and say, Lord, I know this is false. Am I going to re-rationalize it in my mind in order to do what I want to do? Or I'm going to continue on the genuine path and say yes to Jesus Christ, no matter how much it hurts, no matter how much sacrifice, no matter what it is, no matter how much how humbling or whatever it causes. Is Jesus Christ going to be Lord today? How about tomorrow when another challenge comes along? Will Jesus Christ be Lord? Or are, you, are we going to seek our own? And we saw what happens when you seek your own. We're not going to lead ourselves to heaven. Jesus is the only way. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is, is more than just acknowledging facts. Experiencing eternity, to know that we are a part of His family, knowing that the Holy Spirit is the one who is the one who's going to tell us whether, whether we're a part of the, the family of God or are we still a part of the family of the world. There's many paths off the way, to, the way to heaven, and one of my goals is to stay sober with the Lord myself. So when I'm preaching, I'm going to be preaching a now word. I'm telling the word right now is the goal. Heaven, our Father who art in heaven. We want to be lived by Him. We want to be with Him forever. Now, eternal life begins even now when we come to Jesus Christ for real. He gives us a new nature, a new heart, a flesh. The law of God is applied to our heart, and we learn how to walk it out in this world of, uh, of darkness and blackness and falseness and antichrist. But God is going to keep us sober. Those three H's are going to be focusing heavily in today. Holiness, humility, and honesty. Okay. The first thing I want to look at is holiness. I believe it's about the power and love. Okay, it's not only just love; it's also very powerful and it's genuine and it comes from God. It is intoxicating to everybody on the earth. I don't care what you believe; it's intoxicating and it is very attractive to everybody. Leonard Ravenhill says the most attractive thing is the Spirit of God Almighty on the earth when it's when He's doing what He wants to do. And that's the only way it's ever going to be attractive, attractive is if God is truly doing something that makes you go, now, whoa, that was more than just a little something over here. That was definitely awesome because you saw something that was definitely radical. No one's attracted. The only people who aren't attracted to the Holy Spirit are people who are comfortable being their own king of their own little world like Herod. Something, a prophecy was coming along and he got angry. He says, that's, that's messing with what I want. So I hate the truth. Everybody else really likes it. People in the church, not in the church. Other people who, only people who don't want the Holy Spirit. The only people who are not attracted to the Holy Spirit are people who are comfortable and they don't want to budge to be changed to the, what God is trying to say. They don't want truth. They love a lie and that's why God eventually gives them a strong delusion. No thank you to that. Okay? The Bible says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Okay? And then we've got too many weak versions of salvation where there is no power. You say this is the power of God unto salvation, then show me a changed life. Show me a hatred for sin because if you're born of his spirit, you're going to love what he loves and you're going to despise that which he despises. Anybody who tries to be a leader in the faith, in the Christian faith, that does not hate sin is a false guide because God hates sin. And if you're led of God, you're a true disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will hate sin anywhere it shows its ugly head, especially if it shows its ugly head in ourselves. That's why da David was a man after God's own heart. He said, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me to heaven where you are. Hallowed be thy name, O Father in heaven. Lead me the way you actually want me to go. And if there be anything wicked in me, show me so I can do it. That's the heart of a man after God's own heart. David was one. God himself called him a man after my own heart. And if we are a man after his, his own heart, then we love truth. God's truth. Outside of us and mostly inside of us. If we are not asking God to show us darkness in our heart, do it. Change your ways and repent of that and do it now. David did it. He's a man after God's own heart. That's the standard, okay? Holiness is the first one. It's about power and love, the power of God unto salvation. Another one's called humility. Um, another great cartoon. They lay, nailed it like a like right on the head, okay? Bullseye. It's the hard road of humility, hard road of true confession, 
Okay, the Bible says to confess your faults to one another. When you've done something stupid to one another, you've said something in the flesh, you're like, brother, sister, I failed you. I, went, I was in the flesh. I was out of line. I wasn't bridling my tongue. I failed you. Please forgive me. Confessing your faults one to another. You fall into sin. Long, short, whatever. Confess it to people all you want to if the Lord leads you to. But first, we bring the sin to God. We confess our sins to God himself. Say, God, I have sinned against you. Remember when David messed up, even though he murdered somebody, even though he committed adultery, he said, God, I've only sinned against you. When it comes to sin, it's between you and God. As much as you've offended other people, that is true. But the, but the mega focus is that you have offended deity. You have commit high treason against the awesome, true law of God. It's the moral law, which is going to be a very heavy focus. It's going to be a gigantic pillar among this true church because I want people to always be able to gauge themselves against just perfect truth. It's very natural for us to avoid truth when it comes to us. It's easy for us to love truth when it's against people that we don't like. <coughs> and that's not the way we're going to do it. Because true seekers of God love truth no matter where it's found. Amen. Amen. Here's a scripture. I'm just going to read this one. It's only five verses. You don't have to look it up. It's in Luke, and you can check it out later. This is where um, we're going to start to see something of um, forgiveness. Because we are a holiness church, and sometimes people get into the holiness church, and they lose the foundations of it, and they lose the power, and they lose the love. And so they start to become very hard. They start to become, very un they start to become cold with people. Oh, you're doing this, so I give you no attention at all. That's absolutely false. Jesus Christ loved sinners. He loved to be around them and try to win them over to truth. This is what the scripture says in regards to forgiveness. Then said he unto his disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Whoever is the one offending people left and right better be understanding. Jesus says something to you. Woe. Two, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he was cast into the sea that, that he should offend one of these little ones. Three, take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again thee, saying, I repent. Thou shalt forgive him. Okay? And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith, okay? How many times do we forgive? Seven times? He said 70 times seven, meaning we're going to be a very forgiving people. The people of God are a very, very forgiving people. The Lord is long in his mercy with us. That means he's like that. So when we are genuinely going, I busted it again, and you own up to the things that are coming up. You know, I've been, I've been facing the Lord. I've been praying and fasting more than I've had in a long time. And the Lord has just been opening things up and giving me a clearer perspective on things. And I'm just like, man, how, many, how, many, how much wrongness can you fit in one heart? Even after fo focusing on the truth of God so much and already challenging myself for so long. And yet he's still going, look at these bad habits. Look at these ridiculous things. Look how much you waste your time. Look how unfair you are. And I'm like, oh, I can't believe it. They never were so vivid before. Now it's like HD 5051 Dolby Sound. See how you are not committed to being true when, it's like when you want to just bend it just a little bit like that? That's not straight truth. Do you know the moral law is a straight rod? It's like this. Right, wrong. And there's a straight line in between. It doesn't care how you feel about it. It doesn't change because you have enough money to buy it off. It doesn't care that you smell good. It doesn't care that you look cool. It doesn't care about your type A personality. It doesn't care about anything. It doesn't have a respect of any person's. It's either right or it's wrong. And God's people are like that. They say, this is right. Amen. My heart is engaged into it. I'm devoted there. I'm, I'm subscribed there eternally because it's right. And if it's wrong, no way. No way. Forget about revival until we get this perspective of what is right and wrong. God cares about this thing very, very much. Okay, that's where the third. That's where the third one comes in. Honesty, true to the moral law. The third one is true to the moral law, whether in your favor or knowing it does. Knowing it does not change and is no respecter of persons. Okay, Amen. That sounds familiar. Who else is not respecter of persons? 
God. You know what he says when he's on earth? Jesus says, I'm not going to I'm not going to condemn anybody. I've come to save, seeking to save out. Well, I've come to save you and I'm not here to condemn anybody. He says, don't worry about my word will condemn you. That's what he said. My word will condemn you because his word is perfect. It's saved right and it's wrong. Either you're on the right side of God and his word or you're on the wrong side. And it's it's, it's just like you walk in there and he's like, here, here's the paperwork. Here's the book. It's open. Either your name's in it or it's not. Okay? And so he, he gets pretty pretty blunt about this thing. He says, my word will be the one to condemn you. I won't do it. I can't do it. But I, I am going to be there to let you know whether or not the books say what you want to hear or not. He can't be, the, the moral law cannot be bought off. It cannot be paid off. It cannot be manipulated into grayish area. And it cannot bend to fit anything that is impure at all. Anything unjust, it will not be bent by that. And, it, and it's a very, very scary thing when you get into a kind of a teaching that allows you to kind of fudge over the line that is very definite. It doesn't change. If someone tries to change it, they're a false guide. Here's a, um, here's a thought about being a holiness church. I want, to re, I want to reiterate that while I make sure I hit everything here. Are we a holiness church that will resemble cruelty? I said, no, never. Never. You know why? Because even though our standard is very high, our mercy and sacrifice and understanding is also very great as well. And the Lord's mercy towards us is also very great. If the Lord is like that with us, then if we are really led by the Lord and He's that merciful with us and we are able to recognize that spiritual reality, it would be absolutely, it'd be like unforgiving someone when we're forgiven. He says, you're not forgiven anymore. You know, God's not going to do a work with us if we're not going to be passing the same mercy that he's bestowed to us to others as well. Amen. Here's the next one, y'all. The Beatitudes. I'm going to read these things right here. There's a lot of um, awesome perspective on the, on, the, on the standard right here in um, Jesus' awesome sermon on the mount. Here's a piece that we need to remember um, to gauge ourselves again, look at the mirror of truth, and, and see ourselves in the midst of it. <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. That is awesome. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Amen. 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. All right, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's the first one. He's talking about people who are lowly in their own self. Because all we see here, everything in the world is basically antichrist. As much good as there is, it's overall, the overall focus is not the specific commission of the gospel. So people who say, this is what's going on, that's cool. I'm going to take the underside of it because I'm not really, I can't really be a part of it wholeheartedly. Only a, only a part of it. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. People who are not going to be a part of that, they'll, they'll be poor on purpose. They'll come and come low on purpose in humility. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. The Bible talks about in James, it says that to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And that's where the Holy Spirit can really start to move there. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay, maybe that's a picture of the new earth, but it's, it's describing something that's um, often described as weak. Whenever you hear the word meek, don't think about weak, because that's not really true. Meek only means that you are very, very powerful in God, but you're not out of control with your power. I've seen people who are very powerful, but they don't have any wisdom, and so they act like, they act crazy. A lot of times you'll see that with people who are street preachers. They, um, they're, they're, they're very powerful in a way, but they lack a lot of wisdom, and so their mouths are they're full of a, lot of a lot of rhetoric and a lot of stuff that's not safe. And the, the way it was described to me, it was like a man who was, he was, um, he was a truck driver. He pulls up to this, like, like a biker stop where they, where they serve spaghetti. And he went in there, and he wasn't dressed like everybody else with, with all their leather and chains and whatnot. And so he, uh, he sits in there, and he was kind of like a, you know, kind of a shoe that didn't quite fit the, the, the whole picture there. 
and some guy takes his spaghetti bowl and dumps it on top of the guy's head, the trucker's head. And did the trucker get mad and start fighting or nothing like that? No, he was meek. He was, you know, he's a powerful man. He's smart, but he was in control. He didn't lose his head. So he just takes the spaghetti off of him and walks out the door, gets in his truck. And then the, and then one of the, and then the, one of the guys in there says, well, that guy, not, not much of a man, huh? Didn't do anything. He says, yeah, he's not much of a driver either. He just knocked over six bikes on the way out. You know what I mean? Because he's in control. He does it, he does it in a different way. You, know, you understand? I know it's kind of a joke, but people who are meek, they're very powerful, but they don't, they don't act it out because they don't have to. Their power comes from walking in humility. Hunger and thirst after righteousness, being right with God, they shall be filled. The Holy Spirit will decide who's righteous and who's not. He says you will be filled. If you really want that, it'll happen. There'll be times of refreshing for those merciful it shall obtain mercy. You know, like I was talking about, when we're, when we're willing to forgive other people, God will forgive us. We're merciful to others. God will bring that judgment against us sometimes and make it be more merciful to us, which we need. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know I do. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, keeping ourselves pure in things that don't match the truth, and we know it doesn't, not to let our hearts get defiled with things that's not true. The peacemakers, not ones that are causing strife and causing contention everywhere we go, trying to be the big guy. It's not humble, right? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? We're getting the point. There's a lot of portraits of the truth right here. The standard of heaven, standard right here, is also in Job 9. I'm going to read the whole chapter right here in Job 9. You can listen along, and or you can read along. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth. But how should a man be just with God? Okay? This is the portrait of, a, of justification. Now, I'd like to say something before I read this chapter even further. I'm quite aware that the first, like, 30 chapters of Job, you know, basically, is when all these arguments are happening. You've got Job, who is kind of in a funny spot right now. He's a good, perfect man, the Lord says, and he's being perfected. And there's three people who are supposed to be his friends that are trashing on him. And so right here you're seeing Job, him, he's defending himself... And this is a really interesting portrait of something that we don't often see because a lot of people, it's a risky thing preaching out of Job because you know that later on it starts to say that you guys are all wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is the Word of God, and I believe there's two ways to look at the book and say, well, some, in some sense they're wrong, but God is perfecting a very perfect man. He was a good man. He did really good. Verse 3 says, if he, if he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who had... Hardened himself against him, and hath prospered. Which removeth the mountains, and they know not. Which overturneth them in his anger. Which shaketh the ear out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble. Which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars. Which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea. Which maketh Architurus. Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south. He's describing the, uh, the, the constellations and the stars right there. Number 10 says, Which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wondrous without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doth doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. How much less shall I answer him, and choose out of my words to reason with him? To whom, though I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make a supplication to my judge. If I had called, and he had answered me, yet would I not believe that he had hearkened unto my voice. For he breaketh me with a tempest, and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. If I speak of strength, lo, he is strong. And if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? If I justify myself, mine own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. There's a big, big one right there to help us understand the standard. And we'll look at that a little bit later, too, where you see a, a standard like this where someone tries to justify themselves and call himself perfect versus someone who wants to be justified of God and be real. 21 says, Though I were perfect, yet would I not know my soul. 
I would despise my life. This is one thing, therefore I said it. He destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. Oh, man. If the scourge slay suddenly, he will laugh at the trial of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covereth the faces of the judges thereof, if not where, and who is he? Now my days are swifter than a post. They flee away, they see no good. They are passed away as the swift ships, as the eagle that hasteth to the prey. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will leave off my heaviness and comfort myself. I am afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. If I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? <laughs> that was the one that really stuck out to me where I wanted to preach about the, or go into the whole scripture right there. He said, if I be wicked, why then labor I in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet shall, shalt thou plunge me into the ditch, and mine own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let, his, and let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. So number 29 says, If I be wicked, why then I labor in vain? Okay. That's not a good idea. We want to be real, okay? One of the portraits of humility that I've seen uh, among some of the great men of God, they didn't get great because they were playing games with God. They were, they were great because God raised them up. And a lot of the portraits that you see here has been uh, many heroes of, my fa of the faith. He says, have shown true humility and honesty. One of the guys that I used to know is a pastor at a New Song Church. He was a mentor to me for a while, and he was into... Um, he was... He used to do photography before he was a full-time minister. And um, while he was doing that, he did some things that were um, a little bit uncouth. He was being dishonest with the, with the way he did his money, and he was cheating people out of money. And he, he knew it, and eventually come to terms with it. And uh, he finally said, I can't hide this anymore. This is too ridiculous. And he came clean with it. And he, and he was just like, I feel so stupid, you know? And I've been confessing things openly to so many people, and I say, I feel so stupid. But you know what? Ultimately, that's the real growth. That's where you're actually going to get somewhere, you know? Someone, people have been tapping me on the shoulder and telling me all these things about me. Oh, Rob, you told me you were going to be throwing that thing away, and, and it's still there. Like a week later, I'm like, you remember that? I'm like, I don't even remember saying that, you know? You know, just, just casually saying things. But people hear your words, and they can see whether are you a man of your word or are you not. And it matters. And God's like showing me how important it is what I say and what I do. It matters. People notice it. And it's either a testimony of good or not. Well, this guy, he, he, he was cheating people, and he finally come clean, and he's telling his wife, like, I feel like an idiot. I'm so, I'm so embarrassed. And, and she says, no, no, you did come clean. Yeah, you messed up, but you got right, you know? How, how much, I mean, that's good that you want to be right. You, you found yourself doing something stupid. Something was in your heart. It was revealed. You're praying, God, if there's any wicked way in my heart. And God showed him. And if he didn't say good, now I repent then he doesn't really care. Jesus Christ is not Lord. He's Lord. He's like, I'm sorry. Persecution comes or tough times come. I don't want to be real with God anymore. I'm not going to continue on the path. Well, here's another one. He got right and that was a good deal. It's good to be real and come clean. George Whitfield, street preacher from back in the day, probably a few hundred years ago, preached to thousands in the street and said to the listeners, if they would not weep over their sin, then he would weep over their sin for them. And he tipped his head back and sobbed like a baby in front of the whole thousands of people that would watch him for hours under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Powerful man of God, one of the most powerful men I've ever heard about, weeping in front of everybody. John Bevere openly talks about his own struggle with pornography and frequent masturbation, even after being saved, even as a minister. And he was telling everybody, this is what happened, and it took me years to get free. He's very open about it. He's very honest about it, and God continues to raise him up. I don't agree with him totally. I don't agree with all his associations, but I certainly do agree that the power of God is definitely doing a work, and it's like, I know the working of the Holy Spirit. I've, I've already met God. I've already met the Lord. I already know what he looks like. I know the working of the Holy Spirit. I know when you're doing wrong, things are going to look like nuts. Everything's going to be, un it's going to be fruitless. God will only give you as much as you're willing to go with him, because it's all his strength anyway. And I've seen the work there, so I stick up for him and say, yes, amen. Be real. And he did. Now he was delivered finally after a tremendous war 
finally gained victory over that junk. Okay? Same thing happened to David Wilkerson. Confessed his own, his own false prophecies. He said they were flesh. He says his earthly struggle with sensual TV could have left him ministering without God. He says, no, I pick you, God. I'll tell the whole congregation. And he did. It's on the internet. Anybody can watch him say, I was prophesying in the flesh. I was looking at trash on the television at a hotel. No one would have known. I could have continued hiding it. But guess what? You, how are you going to hide from God? How can you ever want to touch God and then continue on and not be real? I, had, I just put a thing on my page on Facebook saying, it is a scary, scary thing for people to have a genuine testimony <laughs> and not continue on with God. It's like you knew, so you have a higher standard. God's going to hold you to a way higher standard because you actually heard the Holy Spirit in the first place. You're going to be in more trouble than the sinners. It's not funny. It's terrible. Testimony over here is good, but his steps are forever. Amen. Next one is like this. Carter Conlon was preaching one of his best sermons I've ever, ever heard called Run for Your Life in regards to the false faith in it sweeping over the nations. And he's talking about everybody, please. Run for your life and get away from all these different fake versions of church and run to Jesus Christ. And he starts bawling his eyes out, starting like, please, come back. There's streams of rejoicing. Another powerful man of God right under David Wilkerson's ministry. Now he's the senior pastor of that church. Man of God preaching an incredible message. He's yelling, and then he starts bawling his eyes out. Delaney Swagger did the same thing. He's preaching about the wolves on TV preachers. He says, he just starts talking about them. He's ripping on them so hard, just coming against him with such a fervency and just starts weeping over it again. He's like, how can I not weep? This is seriously happening and all these people think they're right. And there's never any dealing. There's no sword of the spirit. It's supposed to be sharper than a two-edged sword, which is already sharp enough. But this is sharper to get right down to the business that says, guess what? I'm real. You're not. Do you care to do my will or not? Some people do care and they actually bend and they humble themselves. They get honest and they get holy. Those are the three H's that is God's standard and it isn't going to change because we have an attitude problem and we think we're better than God. Luke 18. Luke 18, verse 9. This is a Pharisee and the publican. And you see truth and you see falseness. And this is the kind of thing that juggles in our hearts all the time. And he spake a parable unto them to this end. The men also, the men ought to also to pray and not to faint saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God neither regarded man and there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying avenge me of mine adversary and he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself though I fear not God nor regard man yet because this widow troubleth me I will avenge her lest by her continually come and she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not judge, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And he spake a parable unto, unto a certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men, here it is, went into the temple to pray. The one is a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. You can see him looking over his, out of his corner of his eye. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. One person left that temple walking with Jesus, taking the next step, staying on the standard that leads to heaven, holy. Why? Because he was so good? No. He knew he wasn't good. And that's how you be holy, is be telling the truth. God, I own up to everything you showed me. I didn't keep my word there. I'm annoying in this habit over here. I'm, I'm trying to readjust things to fit my own life right here. I own every one of them. Guess what? Next time I'm going to do better. Every day I'm going to do better in all the things. 
that you keep showing me. Someone tries to correct you and you, you come up with a verse as to why they're not true. You're not going anywhere. You're not moving forward. That's not a step of the Lord. We need to be like the man on their knees and say, I'm not even going to look at heaven. I'm embarrassed. How can I talk about heaven? All kinds of tests popping up today. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I, have, an, I have my way and I'm going to do it your way. Text message or the, the message from this guy. Can I can I sell you these these tracks? And I'm like, sure, they're valid. I, if they're, I find out that they were real. He showed me the pictures. They looked real to me, and I'm still about ready to. What? Why a no? God said no. Who cares why? God says no. Then no. no. Amen. amen? How about an amen? Amen. 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 Can we say yes to Jesus? Yes. Your yes way. To Jesus. He says no. Then no. He says yes. Then yes. <laughs> Let your yay be yay and let your nay be nay. Amen? Amen. Well, this guy is over here trying to, trying to exalt himself. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do what I want. One day God will just bury me with all kinds of old-fashioned chick tracks, or he won't. Whether he does or he doesn't, I'm doing what he says, and I'll take the lower path on purpose. Hallelujah. Because that's where he can bring you up. And my interest is to be like Charles Finney and be that no nonsense in my obedience to Christ. As he speaks, he knows he can trust me to say yes and quick. Do I think about other people when, it, when he says something? How long am I going to look when that happens? How is that going to rub other people? How is that an obedient servant? He says that a man who wore it does not even think about that. He, does not, he doesn't get carried away with that kind of stuff. And that's how we ought to be. Our devotion needs to be militantly on. Quick, quick, quick. Sharp, sharp, sharp. That is the standard for heaven. That's the three things. Hope you don't forget them. Holiness. Holiness is not morality alone. Mor holiness is a, is a continue, continued honesty before you and the Father. Continued honesty. Okay? Holiness and the fruit of it is you will be humble. If you ever get holy without humility, your, your holiness is going to be very dark very quickly. Because God's Spirit moves in humility. It goes low. For those who are low in spirit, his, He says that that's where I am. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the eternal life, it begins now. When we come into agreement with God is what he's trying to say right now. In humility, that's where he's at. Your confession is true. You're a correctable personality. Guess how much I hated hearing that I did wrong? Every time someone did that, I felt this just untold terror over me. Just this untold like, Argh. I'm going to eat this one because I'm not going to fail the test. They're not saying that for no reason. They're not saying that because they're mad at me. They're not. They're just saying, guess what? When you, when you do what you do, you drive me crazy. I'm like, good. I won't do it anymore. And I felt myself wanting to continue tapping and doing the things I'd, I've done for years. Oh, the only people who ever challenge me on that are people who are really, no. It's annoying to anybody. It's not good enough for Charles Finney. And it certainly isn't good enough for me. Because I'm aiming at the best standard I've ever seen. One of the best I've ever seen. God, nothing's going to stop me from doing your perfect will. You say, I do. That's my life. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You worthy. He's Amen. worthy. Yes. Amen. Yes. Heavenly Father, that is our heart. No matter how crazy things get, Lord God, I know that you are rich in mercy. You are so merciful and so patient with us, Lord God. As we are trying to get it right, Lord God, that's the kind of heart that you continue to work with like the publican. He was trying to get it right, Lord God, and you continue to move there. He walked out justified, Lord, not like he never sinned at all, but you pardoned his sin. You look past his sin. You hide a multitude of sins when we be real with you. We confess our sins, and you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins, God. And you keep us strong. You keep us on the narrow way. You keep us in light. You keep us in the life, Lord in the life flow that is genuine, Lord, while people are talking about it and they don't know you, they don't fear you, they try to exalt themselves, and they're going to be abased, Lord God. But I don't want to be that kind of people. I don't want these people to be, uh, that think that they're okay, Lord God, while Satan is putting up all these signs that says they lead to heaven. And you said, I already told you, that's the wrong path, Lord God. I pray that we be a people that doesn't agree with lies to make it fit our comfortable needs. But we put you first, not just by word, but in our feet, in our heart, and we know we've committed in all ways. And no matter what comes along, Lord God, that it'll continue to shine true. And even if we miss it, next time we'll get it right. Bless every heart. Keep us to the last day. 
Jesus' name, amen. Amen.